want to present our uh, speaker for this evening is uh, Brandon Medina. And Brandon is a Civil War reactor from Green Bay. And I understand that he will be sharing information with us about uniforms. And with that, let's welcome Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody for having me. Um, thank you for coming. I was asked to do this maybe three quarters of a year ago by Ryan back there. And honestly, I didn't know what to do it on first. I really wanted to do it on Confederate prisoners at Camp Randall, but there's so little information on it, I just wasn't able to give a whole talk about it, possibly for another day. Um, so I just kind of went on my fallback, which was uniforms and equipment. Uh, I do Civil War reenacting, um, so I have a lot of it. Uh, all the, everything I do have is the best stuff you could possibly buy. Much of it's hand sewn by myself, friends, people that do a real good job. Everything here over is completely hand sewn, all the uniforms except for the federal frock coat, which that particular one should be machine sewn for that particular example, although some were completely hand sewn. Even though I've never done a talk like this to a group of people, I started at 11 years old, I was giving tours of buildings. So I've given different tours at Heritage Hill, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with in the Ford area. I gave tours at Hazelwood, which was a home of Morgan Martin in Green Bay. And I've did that for many years, although it's been a few years since I've done that. So I do have a little of experience talking in front of people, so I hope I do a good job. If anybody has any questions at any time, raise your hand, just yell out, whatever you want to do. I will open it up to questions at the very end. And everybody's welcome to look at anything they'd like to after. You can touch things. Um, the only thing I ask you don't touch is when I talk about how they made uniforms and because I don't want any of those pieces to be missing because I can't really replace them. <laughs> but first of all, I'll start talking about the uniforms and just kind of make my way down this way. I will talk a little bit about the soldiers carried with them, some of the stuff at the very end there. You can see the whiskey bottle and whatnot. Almost everything here is reproductions, but there are some originals, which I'll mention if they are originals when it comes to that. Now I do have Union and Confederate items, so a little mixture of everything here for all of you to see. Just a small example, obviously there were many different styles of jackets, pants, just about everything here and everything you can imagine from the beginning of the war to the end of the war on both sides. First one here is a sack coat. This would be the most common sack coat you could possibly get. This is what basically everybody in the United States Army was issued at one time or another. This particular one is copied from the Shuka Arsenal. I made this particular one myself and I was talking about original items. The buttons on here are original on this one. Shuka Arsenal, they used in the Eastern Theater, the Western Theater, every time of the war. So this would be your most common one of your most common style. Um, you can see it's completely hand sewn. Everything from the arsenal except for one original example was completely hand sewn. What would happen was they would give out kits similar to this one. This is from a Columbus Depot. And you would have all different pieces. This would be an arm right here. All the way down to your collar pieces, your cuff pieces, all the small pieces right here. And they would cut them out at the arsenals. They would give them out to women. And then the women would sew them. They'd be given back to the arsenal. And typically it was kids who would sew on the buttons. When they were given out, they would get X amount of money for a jacket, X amount of money for a pair of pants, whatever they happen to be sewing. And then women would make money that way. It is believed that one of the reasons why everything from this arsenal was machine sew, or I'm sorry, hand sewn, was because not everybody had machines. They were pretty rare back then, and one person could crank out as many as they possibly can, where the next person could only make one every day or two, or however good they were at sewing. And every example, you see little differences. Uh, maybe somebody was trying to cut some time and be a little bit easier for themselves. You see some examples of real good stitching and some examples of real bad stitching. Um, one thing you notice, too, is the bright colors on the inside. From this particular arsenal, they use all different kind of crazy colors and patterns and everything like that. And it's believed that there was um, a manufacturer, a material manufacturer down the road at a mill. And they basically just got whatever was the cheapest and basically at the clearance of their time, they would just buy what everybody else didn't want. It's not 100% or nobody knows 100% if that's accurate, but it more than likely is. 
they were made different places. Uh, three of these are Waterbury. They would have been the biggest manufacturer, I believe, anyway. Uh, I believe the top one says good, qual good quality, I think, or best quality, extra quality. And you know when it's extra quality, it's not really extra quality. The other ones are nicer. <laughs> <laughs> now for the Confederate Army, when the Confederate Army first started, they would have had a commutation system where basically nothing was set up for the Confederacy. They had to get stuff wherever they could, and they'd be reimbursed for um, their clothing. Um, once about 1862, beginning 1862, they started manufacturing from different arsenals and giving out items for, depending on where they were, Eastern Theater, Western Theater, they had different arsenals. And this particular one would be something similar to either a commutation jacket or something sent from home. There's reports of soldiers, entire regiments, companies, whatever it was, getting all brand new sets of uniforms and all matching, and within a week or two it was all mismatched because they liked the stuff that was sent for their moms or wives or girlfriends or whoever it happened to come from. This is one example of that. This one, um, a friend of mine sold this and actually started a pattern from a mystery jacket, but he made some changes so it'd be more commutation, something sent from home. This particular one is Tiger Stripe, which I know some of you are reenactors, and normally you don't see this. I don't believe anybody's even made this material in years, but this would have been fairly common along with just your normal grays and butternuts and those type of colors. What type of material is that? This is a gene wool. Uh, much of the Confederacy used gene wool, which is wool weaved in one way and then cotton weaved another way. There were different kerseys and cashmeres, but um, the Confederate ones I have here are all gene wool in this particular instance. This is a very co common Confederate jacket too. This would have came out of the Richmond, Richmond Depot. This is what we would consider a type two. Type ones came out earlier, a little bit early in the war in 1861. It's basically exactly the same as this. They would have just had some possibly piping on the sleeves, otherwise they use tape on the sleeves as well as the epaulettes on top here and the collar. Um, every example, like I said before, is a little different. Possibly it could just be whoever made it, decided to cut corners or whatever is simplest for them. Uh, some had a higher collar, some had a lower collar. Um, just little differences in every single one. Any differences you could possibly imagine, it was probably there. They started making the Type 2s possibly as early as spring of 1862 and made these to 1864. So this would have been the one that was used the most of all, everything that came out of the Richmond Depot. These were extremely common in the Eastern Theater and seen basically all the major battles that you can think of out there from Gettysburg to wherever. Um, a lot of more male gene wool like I talked about. Uh, so especially later on once the British started importing they would have used British cloth that was a blue-gray type of color kersey. Um, and then the last style, which would have came, I believe, 1864, they started coming out, I don't remember exactly when, uh, mid-late 1864, um, would have been basically exactly the same. This would have taken the epaulets off, as well as the belt loops on the side. Another item that they would have had are frock coats. This would have been the federal frock, or federal dress coat that they would have used. Um, this particular one is a contract version of it. And you can see everything here is lined. Um, these do have, um, um, I'm sorry, I can't think right now. Um, what's that? No, no, not pleats. Um, there, well, I believe there are pleats. No, actually there are no pleats on the outside. But these would have been padded, is what I meant to say. Um, Pretty much everything that officers would have used would have been padded. Once you got to an officer, you had to buy your own uniform, so you see lots of different variations there. Sometimes they were allowed to buy stuff from their arsenal, so you'd see some, especially Confederate jackets that were altered um, and made a little bit better. Maybe they might have put some type of different collar on it or something like that. But most of the time, you're not gonna see that listed, although they did do some field modifications. A majority of those would be just extra pockets and things like that. But this would be the, the federal dress coat right here. Does that have the pockets in uh, This does. They do have pockets in the tails, which I'll show you the inside here. They have a pocket on each side and the tails. And these are functional pockets. Those are made of wool? Yep, these are 100% wool. 
hopefully I'm not going too fast here. Like I said, if anybody has any questions, let me know at any time. I don't want to go too fast. There's no clock here, so I don't know exactly how fast I'm going. Now, the Confederacy also have frocks. This is another one. And like I said, this one is actually machine sewn, or partially machine sewn. It is hand sewn in the correct areas. This one is completely hand sewn right here. And this was also a very common jacket that they had in all times of the war, from the beginning of the war to the end of the war, all times in between. Uh, the Confederacy in particular wore a lot of these. The North, not as much. I uh, did see a little bit, like the Second Wisconsin was really known, or I'm sorry, the Iron Brigade, Second Wisconsin, Sixth Wisconsin, Seventh Wisconsin, they were kind of known for wearing these jackets, although they didn't wear them the entire war. It just would have been when they were issued, and, but it's what they're known for wearing anyway. Now, winter came, they also had to have overcoats. I don't have a federal overcoat here, although a friend of mine is making it, so I wish I would have had it for this, but I don't. Um, I do have a Confederate overcoat. This particular one is copied from a soldier named Archibald Smith. He was in the Georgia Battalion of Cadets. This particular one would have been worn from the winter of 64 into 65. It's a civilian type of jacket. It's double-breasted. The original had rubber buttons on it, hard rubber buttons like this one has, or similar to what this one has. And it also has a cape on it that's detachable, which you didn't see as often. The federal ones would have had a cape on it. It wasn't detachable, which it is pretty nice if you want to take it off. You don't need it. And actually, the original one that it was copied from does not have the cape on it. So we don't know exactly what the cape would have looked like, but judging by other examples, this would be real similar. Some capes did have pockets in it, um, but a majority of them were roughly the same length, and you can get a good imagining of what it would have looked like anyway, judging from others. And it is real long too, I know it almost drags on the ground when I'm wearing it, but the original was like that too. Kind of have to roll up the cuffs, and, uh, but of course I'm assuming they probably did that on purpose also, because when it's cold outside, you can roll them down and have your hands covered. Um, it's just what they had. Rubber buttons were fairly common, especially in civilian clothing. Um, Goodyear patented them in, I don't remember the exact year, it was 1850s anyway. Not the same Goodyear as makes your tires, but that's actually who they named Goodyear tires after was a guy that invented the hard rubber back then. What is the material? This is Genewell. Uh The lining inside the cape as well as the body, it's the same lining, is just a cotton. A uh, friend of mine actually made it. He did get a pattern. I believe the original one is in the, I believe, Atlanta History Museum or something like that. And I believe he got it straight from them. It might have been somebody else that copied it. Uh, you don't see these very often in the reenacting world. There are a couple people that made them, but from what I've seen in pictures anyway, they really don't look like it that much. Uh, this one is a lot closer, like I said, in my opinion, than the other ones that were made looking at the original. Um, I only wore it once, to be honest with you. There's one here, and I don't think there's any on the inside. Nope, no pockets on the inside. Where do you get that uh, uh, fabric? Um, this particular fabric, as well as, actually, I'm not sure if any other, some of the pants here. Um, this is from Ben Tart right here. Um, the lining, I believe, was just picked up at a local store, just a cotton or whatever. I mean, you could get basically exactly the same as they had back then from um, Joanne Fabrics or whatever. Um, I'm not sure all these. I know um, this one right here was a Wamba White kit there out of Kilmazoo, I believe it is, Michigan. And one thing I did forget to mention about this one, this particular jacket is logwood dyed. When logwood is brand new, it's kind of a bluish grayish material, or color rather. But this one, if you look real close, you can actually see it's different colors in different spots, so it would have oxidized like the originals. Confederacy used a lot of um, either logwood dyed, walnut dyed, iron dyed, basically whatever they could dye it with, and a lot of times they did change color. So what you see in museums, that butternut that we normally think of, odds are it wasn't that color when it was brand new. It would have been either similar to this and I know I mentioned that, that all the stitching here is logwood dyed. Uh, originally that would have been blue also, uh, and it just fades to that. They fade rather quick. Um, I don't use it very often, so it's not going to fade real often for me, but if you can imagine a soldier on the field, 
they get a lot of use out of it, they're in the sun all day, it's gonna fade a lot quicker on them. Yes? You said uh, you showed up that uh, Confederate along that code, and yep. uh, you said you didn't have one of the Union, would that have been? Oh, I'm sorry, the overcoat? The great coat? Yep, that would have been a great coat. Um, like I said, a friend of mine is making one for me right now. They're not cheap. A lot of times reenactors don't have them. Even for material alone, I don't even want to say how much I'm spending. He's making it for free because he wants to make one. When, when they were making the originals, you said a like, contract out to whoever, did they furnish them with the outer material or was that up to the person awarded the contract to get it? What I'm getting at is, yeah, different shades of blue. They would have different shades. Um, some were lighter, like, if you look at these two materials together, right. you can obviously see a difference in these two, and you would have seen differences like that back then as well. Um, they didn't have all the processes that we have now to get it exactly the same color. Um, a lot of them would have been um, indigo dyed. Um, I'm not sure if they had any other ways of doing it back then, to be honest with you, but you would have seen differences just like this from the dark blues to the light blues. Um, but does that answer your question? I'm sorry. What about piping on them? I mean, was that more reserved for officers or? Uh, piping was done on confe um, Confederate as well as Union items. The only one that has piping that I have anyway is this frock coat, which you can see on the top here there's piping as well as the sleeves has piping also. Um, as I mentioned with the R Richmond depots, this particular, particular one doesn't have any tape or piping but the type ones, so the first ones that came out on the sleeves would have had real similar to that one where it kind of comes up to a point similar to a triangle. And some of those had tape and some were piped. Um, I know you were mentioning where they got the material from. As far as I know, all the contractors would have had it by themselves, made it for themselves. Um, most of the time they would have made them and shipped them to wherever they were going. Sometimes it would just buy kids. One example is the Tate jacket that came from Ireland really in the war. Um, most of everything that they made was machine sewing. Um, for the most part anyway, you have your sleeve linings and buttonholes and things like that that would have been hand sewing. Um, I'll get with you in a second. Oh, if there's something you want to add in maybe. Uh, when you lifted up <coughs> the, the frock coat, mm -hmm. it had buttons on the sleeve. Uh, the reason for that, you probably know this, there wasn't any pocket, so you wouldn't wipe your nose because the buttons are in the way. I never heard that one before, but... That's why they put buttons on the suit. But you didn't have a, you know, I didn't want you wiping your nose on that. <laughs> That's new to me also. <laughs> yeah, it was not on the Confederate one, though, so I guess they didn't care if they would wipe their nose on their sleeves. <laughs> Uh, yeah, all the Confederate items that I have here are jean cloth, and like I said, jean cloth, it was just a little bit cheaper, especially in the Confederacy, they had a lot of wool, but they didn't have the, or I'm sorry, they had a lot of cotton, but they didn't have the wool, so it would have just been an easier material for them, so it would be kind of half and half type of thing, although they did use it in the Union Army as well, inside of uh, overcoats, a lot of times you would see that as jean wool and different particular things, but majority was 100% wool for the Union. And as I was talking about before with the material, especially I was talking about the Tate jacket, most of those were machine sewn and sent in all the way from Ireland. I had to get them through the blockades, which a lot of times things didn't always get through, but a majority did. Th that particular jacket, which I don't have a copy of it here, um, was used in the Petersburg campaign as well as the retreat to Appomattox. And most of those that came in were completely done. However, Alabama had a contract with them where they basically got kits like this one that were sent across, and then women in the area would sew them again. However, those would have been completely hand sewn, at least I'm assuming every example, or almost every example, where everything else would have been a majority machine sewn. Uh, for pants, this is also a shoe kill arsenal, just like the, the coat that I have here. Again, this is completely hand sewn. You see different makers' marks, the SA there with Sanford Suka Arsenal. Um, these have mule ear pockets right here, similar to what pockets have now. We don't think of them coming out, but our pockets on jeans are just a little bit tapered in there. And um, a lot of times they would have flash pockets, so the ones just going right along the seam. But not 
too different from pants that we have today. Confederate pants were basically the same. This is something that similar to what they would have had at the Richmond Depot, but again, they're all basically the same, whether they came from Eastern Theater or Western Theater, there weren't a lot of differences. Again, these are gonna be completely hand sewn, made out of jean wool, just like, um, just like the jackets and everything that I have here. How many stitches are there? It depends on where it is. Certain areas should have more stitches than others. Uh, your outside seams, you don't need as much as the inside seams for obvious reasons. Um, I know when I was sewing it, usually on the fly, I'll kind of make them look a little bit nicer, but it, these are even completely hand sewn. Uh, the buttonholes are hand sewn, and if you talk to anybody that hand sews buttonholes, nobody likes doing it, especially in this type of material, because it frays very easily. Yes? When did the zipper uh, start getting manufactured? Uh, honestly, not sure. I think I have heard at one point, but I don't remember. During the Civil War, there were no zippers, so you wouldn't see it on anything during the war. Uh, that one, the uh, pants you had there, was that one, first the blue one, uh, not made for suspenders, and the other one was made for suspenders, or were the buttons on the inside? Um, these, actually, the, the original ones, uh, actually, it's missing a button there I have to replace. The original ones only have one button on the front. Um, these had two, so a lot of times you see a field modification where they have two because a lot of suspenders at the time, which I was going to get to, had two different spots for it on the front. They did use belts as well. Uh, I don't have any particular ones, but um, as far as I know, they both would have been used. One wouldn't be way more common than the other. This particular set right here comes in two pieces, like many of them that they would have had. They wouldn't have been stitched together in the back or anything. And the material on this was actually made special. Um, it's copied from a pair of one of Lee's couriers. Um, he wore this particular style and these were made exactly, or very similar anyway, to the ones that he carried. They didn't have suspenders or braces. They weren't issued. They were braces. Or braces, I'm sorry, <laughs> same thing. <laughs> They were not issued though, so they would have either purchased them from a sutler, maybe sent from home, uh, wherever they can get them. Same with belts. So if you wanted to keep your pants up, if they were falling down, you basically just had to get your own. <coughs> Another one, which I'm actually still sewing this, so you see there's no belt in the back like the other one, and there's no buttons or one top button hole. They're almost done, but I want to bring them as just another example anyway. And you can see they're blue. In the beginning of the war, what was actually, um, it was regulation, was blue trousers. A lot of those would be kersey and different materials. It's kind of a darker blue than the ones here. Um, but this particular one is jean wool again, and it would have been blue, and we think of blue for federal, but they use it a lot in the South as well. Um, also, it went the other way. In the beginning of the war, uh, a lot of regiments, volunteer regiments, wore gray. Uh, especially at the first battles, um, Manassas, Bull Run, whatever you want to call it, you hear of them firing at their old men and uh, people dying because of that. The flags look very similar. Uh, the first National Confederate flag looked very close to the American flag. And then when you get a bunch of, say, Federal guys coming out in gray, um, a lot of times they were yelling, don't shoot, friendly fire type of thing, but it didn't always work out the way they meant to. So the United States got rid of the gray fairly quick. Uh, Confederacy, not as much. You see blue, as I mentioned. The British um, blue-gray that they were sending in look similar to federal blue, maybe a little bit darker, but again, when you're in smoke or dark or whatever, it's very hard to tell the difference. Um, you hear some reports because the United States said anybody would be killed and uh, basically executed as a spy if they were wearing it, and there's different reports that I've read where basically all they can get was federal gear, maybe it was captured from somewhere, and one particular one that sticks out in my head, I don't remember the exact story, but they seen two Confederates running off and they were following a trail of clothes because they were basically stripping off all their clothes because if they were captured, they didn't want to get killed. And the Federal soldiers were actually laughing about it because they weren't actually going to kill them. They know that they weren't spies. But these guys, I don't know if they're totally naked or almost naked, but they were just stripped off the clothes so they wouldn't get shot. <laughs> Now, for underneath the clothing, clothing um, I only brought one example. These are brand new. These are never worn. Our drawers. This particular one is copied from an example at, at the museum in Madison at the, um, 
uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a museum in Madison where they have a whole bunch of military clothing. And this is a civilian style right here. Um, the Federals, a lot of times, would have had a flannel type material, which I didn't bring an example of it, but it was a thicker flannel material. This is just more of a lightweight cotton. I believe it's 100% cotton anyway. And basically just the underwear of the time. Do you have the guts enough to tell you people why they wore those? Um, I'm not sure exactly where you're going with that, but if you'd like to add. The chafing. I figured that's where you were going. <laughs> um, yeah, jean, especially jean wool, at least with me, doesn't really feel good on the skin. It's real rough. If you just kind of touch it, it's not that bad, but if you're wearing it for long amounts of time, it definitely is not comfortable. I know some people are allergic to wool or stuff like this doesn't bother me as much, but it definitely bothers a lot of people, but this definitely will bother me if I don't wear something like this. What's that? I never wore drawers. <laughs> Everybody wears different things. <laughs> How many uniforms were they issued? Um, it depends on where you were. It depends what was sent from home. Um, I'm honestly not sure exactly what regulations say. I believe it's two jackets a year or something like that. Uh, pants are different. Um, drawers are different. So I couldn't list off exactly how many you're supposed to get every year. A lot of times they would go for a lot longer too, depending on where they were and how accessible everything was as well. I know a lot of times you hear about their clothing basically falling off of them and other soldiers again issued brand new stuff all the time. Um, yes? Yeah, question to ask you. Okay, in these battles, after the battlefield, uh, if the one side or the other was short and closed, and uh, all these dead soldiers had some pretty doggone good uh, coats and pants is on. Did they bury them all with that clothes on or did they take some of that off? Some of them would have been buried with them. Shoes, like he said, especially in the Confederacy, was a big thing. So if somebody had your size or a very similar size, you might want to take their shoes. Uh, somebody has a better jacket than you, a pair of pants, they would have taken them. A lot of times if you look at Soldiers of the Dead, you can see they've most of the time, they're not actually missing anything besides maybe the shoes, like you had mentioned. But you can see that they're rifling through their pockets, through everything else. Their pants are undone, or um, jackets undone. Sometimes you see the buttons were taken off, especially the Confederate buttons, because they'd want to take them as a souvenir or a war trophy type of thing. Um, a lot of times, too, people think it was just from people going through, the, through their items, trying to find money, your pocket watch, that type of stuff. But a lot of times, it's actually the soldiers themselves looking for their wounds before they died. Um, but yeah, I'm <laughs> not sure exactly where I was going with that. <laughs> yes? If he would be wearing wool, would that shrink on them if it was rain? It, would be it could shrink. There was some shrinkage that would obviously happen. Mm -hmm. um, Only when you took it off. <laughs> if you took it off, yeah, I suppose, if you left it on. Um, you'll see pictures of soldiers. Um, they had four official sizes that would have been issued. And some of the guys were taller, some of the guys were shorter. Uh, most of the time they're fairly skinny, but a lot of times, especially if they just enlisted, they might have a few big guys. And I've already seen pictures of soldiers, might not have been because of shrinkage, but maybe just because that's what they had, where you could literally see the buttonholes going like this on each one, and you know it barely fits, but that's what they were issued type of thing. I know some of these clothing fit me a lot better than others, particularly the Confederate frock coat is definitely tight on me, but I got it from a friend. So, how were they cleaned, and how often were they cleaned? Um, basically, especially for enlisted, you're not going to clean them very often. If you're near a river, or a creek, possibly somebody might wash a pair of drawers, a shirt, something like that. But they're more than likely not going to be cleaned very often. I know you hear reports of women saying that the smell was so bad when they came into their town that if they were in a room, you could barely smell, or you could barely stand the smell. Um, the next item I'll talk about is shirts. This is a federal shirt right here. A lot of times it'd be male wool. This particular one is wool, um, as well as different flannels. Um, as you've noticed, there was a lot of wool. Think about the south, even during the summer or during the winter, it's not really as cold as it's up here. But what it was was durability. They're going to last a long time. They're not going to break down as fast. So basically it wasn't made for comfort, it was made for durability as well as fashion. At the time they still wore a lot of wool. You see guys wearing suits, women in the big long dresses and whatnot. So it was just more of the style of the time as well. One other thing is wool's gonna keep you warm when it's wet. 
might not be as great in summer, but in winter time, even if you did get wet, wool will keep you warm. Cotton would have been used a lot also. This is more of a Confederate example right here, which looks a little dirty, but it's actually brand new. It's just made out of some material that somehow got dirty. I don't know, I've never worn it before. And this particular one, again, is completely hand sewn, just like the rest of them here. I'm not going to go through every single shirt here because I do have different examples, but I thought I'd just bring a few here. This particular one is actually from what you would see at a reenactment, extremely rare in reenacting world. However, they were very common during the war. The pockets kind of bunch up weird, where if you were to wear it, it kind of pulls weird on you, which I don't even know exactly why that would have been popular back then, because it's definitely not comfortable. Um, if you wear a jacket with it, you really don't notice it as much. And even on the inside, different particular parts of it were lined, which you can see the lining on the inside, which is actually the same exact material as this shirt. A friend had some extra material and made it for me. And you can see again, right here on the corner, it was bunched up. This one also has my initials on it right there, uh, cross-stitched. The original shirt that it was based off of, the pattern, the soldier had his initials put in right there in the same exact spot, cross-stitched. So the person that made this for me put my initials and cross-stitched them in there. Many of the shirts would have been made on the square, so they just would have been more of a one size, fits, fits all or most anyway. So they wouldn't be real fitted or anything. A lot of times they'd be fairly baggy. Most of the clothing back then, especially pants and shirts, would have been more on the baggy side. You can see a real lot of tight. You would have seen it a little bit later in the 1870s, but not at that particular time. This is the fall. And it does look maybe a little short, but again, they were kind of baggy, so it's not going to be um, right on, right on the shoulder there. And everything here would be full. Uh, sometimes you do see some examples of drawers being cut down, maybe in the summertime because it's hot, they might cut them above the knee, below the knee. But as far as shirts, you really wouldn't see that. Not to say it was never done, it could have been at some point. But for the most part, anyway, they would have been full. When did you start with the full button down shirts? I see these are only on the collar down uh, three or four buttons. I'm honestly not sure exactly when they came in, but it was post war. Um, I believe 1870s, 1880s, right in there. This would have been what it was. This particular one had three buttons. A lot of times you see this. Some of the times they didn't have a fold-down collar. Sometimes it was more just a stand-up collar. Everything, I believe, yeah, everything here is a fold-down collar, but also would have been popular just to have a stand-up. Um, this one has three. It has a little bit different bottom. As you can see, it kind of opens up and just comes to a point. The federal, the federal one that I have here only has one button on the whole thing here and then it just opened the rest of the way down. So you see different variations at the time, just like today, where you see little differences. But everything at that point would have been roughly a third of the way down, not fully. Button material. The type of buttons, you mean? Yeah. This is a tin button, which you would see a lot of times in federal stuff, just like on the pants. You see the tin here on the fly. Again, tin all the way down. Um, they would have used a lot of bone button. Mother of Pearl would have been also popular. Um, these are original buttons on this one right here. Uh, actually, I think all the buttons might be original. This particular one I made quite a few years ago. And these buttons um, you see a lot of times in camps. These are originals I purchased from somebody, which I even have the box in one of those bins over there, uh, the original box from when they were made. And, um, but you see these in campsites a lot of time throughout the war, they were found everywhere, so that's why I put these particular ones, I got a good deal on them, I happened to come across some originals. And these were Japan, these right here. Japan became popular after um, Admiral Nelson's voyage to Japan, where we got a lot of stuff from the Japanese in that area that the Western world and Europe wasn't really accustomed to at that point, and Japaning after that became very common in a lot of things. Also at the time, um, it would help prevent against rust and that type of thing also. So you see it on belt buckles to uh, snuff boxes to whatever you can imagine. Now one thing too, for the clothing, they're going to get rips in it. You're going to get seams that are going to tear. Uh, they didn't have their wives or girlfriends. Most of them weren't tailors, so they would have had to fix it themselves. This right here is called a housewife. 
So you would have everything you needed in here. At the top, you have your needles, uh, some extra um, different material to kind of patch things up if you needed it, which patches at the time weren't just put a patch on the outside so you're good to go. They would have actually been done every example that I've seen anyway and that I know of from the inside. So they would a lot of times would stitch it around, um, maybe a couple times, or um, maybe go with a running stitch around that to just kind of hold it in better. But they would have tried to conceal as much as they can if they could find a material that was similar, similar in color, similar material. But they basically just would have used whatever they had, especially if they're on the field. Um, you would have had extra thread, some thread in here, maybe some extra buttons. I would just a few on here. Um, even little scissors that was stuck in here. I had one, but I couldn't find it before this, so I'm sorry I couldn't show you that. I'm sure it's around somewhere. Now, as far as headgear goes, most of the time when people think of the Civil War, your average person thinks of a kepi. This is what most people would think, very common, common in the Confederacy, not so much in the Union, though. You see the old movies from whenever, back in the 50s or whatever, most of the time the Federals weren't going to be wearing this. This particular one um, has a lining in it. This one is ma mainly machine sewn, like many originals, so that would be correct for this. And they use different materials, too. Um, some were leather, this one's not. It just has, it has oil cloth with um, pasteboard, I believe it's called. I could be wrong on that, so don't quote me on it. Um, but this would just be a common style. Sometimes they had Confederate buttons. This is more just a civilian style right here. Uh, well, it came in all different colors. You can see the uniforms came in different colors. Some would be logwood dyed, like the jacket. This particular one's kind of a greenish color. So again, just whatever they had at the time. Now, when you talk about the Union, like I said, they really didn't have those. They were made, however, they would have been private purchases. Officers, obviously, like I talked about before, would have bought their own uniforms. So a lot of times they would have them if they had that style of hat. But as far as enlisted ranks, it wouldn't have been as common. If you wanted to buy your own, that's fine. But otherwise, most soldiers would have been issued a forage cap. There's two particular forage caps that um, we think of today. This would be what we consider the Type 1. It had a 5-inch brim or a 5-inch top on here, and it was more curved on the brim. The Type 2 would have 6 inch up here and it was more squared off, but they're basically the same. Uh, we call them a forage cap because a lot of times you could forage for food. That's what one of the intentions were. You could keep whatever you wanted, apples if you found some, or if you were issued something, rice or whatever you happened to have. You could put it in here and that's why it was called a forage cap. It's also a Seiko. Uh, Seiko as well. Um, would have supports in there. Bring it up. Yep. That was a dressed uniform hat. Yep. And they took, took the stays out. I don't have any of those. They wouldn't have been as common, maybe a little bit more in the early war, especially with different um, volunteer units and whatnot. But uh, this would have been basically the same, yeah. Stays in there, so it yeah, so it would stay up a little bit more. Some were male leather, some weren't. Um, the Confederacy also would have used a lot of civilian hats. This is just one particular type of civilian hat, just a slouch hat. Uh, most of them, or many of them, were made out of beaver fur. This is beaver fur. Some were made out of rabbit fur and different materials. Um, it depends. Um, some were better than others. Some were thicker. Some weren't as thick. But this particular one is beaver fur right here, as well as this one is beaver fur also. This would have been the 1858 dress hat for the United States Army. This would be what we call a Hardy hat or a Jeff Davis hat, which even though it's Union, one of them were a Confederate president and one was a Confederate general, but that's who they're named after. Um, they, did, they were issued exactly like this. Um, however, a lot of times they did have different brass on it, um, depending on what branch of the Army you were. There were different tassels, blue for infantry, um, red for artillery, yellow for cavalry, and as well as different um, brass in the front as well. Um, I did have one infantry horn, but I'm not sure what I did with that also. Also, you have the Jeff Davis pin here, which you could pin up the side. I know I'm not doing a real good job. And a lot of times it would have been worn like this as well. Getting to the shoes, I do have some socks back here. I figured I wouldn't pull out everything. Uh, socks, some of them were knit by hand, some were uh, made by machine. Uh, they still would have had some work by hand no matter which type it was. Uh, for the Federal Army, you had the Jefferson booties like these right here. 
This particular one is a contract style. Um, similar to what we have for shoes today, a lot of people will tell you they, had, they didn't have lefts or rights. At this particular time, they did, as you can see with this example right here, where you can see, um, see it going in right there. And they were made at the time of very thin leather. Your better shoes were. It's not the real thick leather. I know this particular example that I have back here, I'll show you in a minute, has a little bit thicker than it probably should be. But for the most part, they were thinner. They have wax upper, so they should stay fairly good, fairly waterproof. <coughs> this particular pair is actually brand new. Um, this would have been a civilian style. Uh, civilian style would have been used a lot in the Confederate Army as well as the Union. A lot of times they just would have bought whatever they can get their hands on. If somebody found something, as you had mentioned, steal from the dead or steal from where they can, buy where they can from a sutler, uh, whatever the government could purchase at the time, they might just get because that's all they could get. This particular one right here is copied from a soldier that was in the Washington Artillery. Uh, you can see it's a little bit different than the others, but it's basically just a copy of a civilian shoe. You can see it kind of goes over the top as stitch rather than, than the open, like in these. Um, they did have pegging, which I'm not sure if you can see it as good. Oh yeah, you can see the pegging good on both of these. Uh, some had double rows of pegs like both of these. Some had single rows. Some were also um, just stitched around. So they have a sew sewing machine, or especially earlier in the war, they would do it by hand. And they would go around and sew it. Um, you see a lot of reenactors today have heel plates on it. A lot of that's because of modern surfaces now. They didn't have the concrete and blacktop like we have now. They did use them back then. However, it wouldn't be as common as reenactors. And a lot of times like these, it would just have the nails going around as well as you can see the nails on the bottom of here as well. That would have been the most common way that they would have done it. Now, as far as the... How long did a pair of shoes average uh, last the uh, soldiers uh, when they were marching? It depends on who made them. Some of them would have, they hear reports of them falling apart basically as soon as they put them on to maybe your better manufacturers might last you a month or two, possibly longer depending on who made it. But you gotta imagine these guys a lot of times are marching 10 miles or more a day. They're gonna wear down fairly fast. I know I uh, read one report about Confederate soldiers, which a lot of times they didn't have shoes, which is one of the reasons, like you were talking before, they steal or even the get Battle of Gettysburg started because they were trying to find shoes. And there's one particular one, I don't remember where they were, but one soldier was talking about how we could see the trail of blood from the feet that was in the snow. Um, so all these guys are getting frostbit, their feet are getting torn apart, and they could see the, the blood from everybody's feet that was marching there. Um, these two are leather right here. Mm -hmm. This one is a wax cloth, which would have been also very common at the time. The, uh, the rough side on the outside. Um, sometimes they're a rough side, sometimes they're a smooth side. Again, it just depends. It just depends on who made it, yeah. It depends where they came from, who made it. Um, again, just different variation throughout the war, throughout the contractor, whoever whoever ended up getting it. Yes? Out of the hats, which one do you like wear the best? Um, I'd probably say something more with the brim, which I'm assuming they probably liked a little bit more too, and especially the Confederacies. You'll see them wearing lots of civilian hats. Um, these are nice. They are very comfortable, both of these. However... Don't keep the sun and water. <laughs> exactly. That's what I was just about to say. Um, when it's raining outside, I'd much be rather wearing this. If it's sunny outside, it's gonna keep the sun off your ears, the back of your neck, and it's gonna keep getting sunburned from rain dripping down, although I have had this one actually just dripping right through from being so soaked when I was wearing it. But it takes a lot to do that. Uh, one other thing about the fur felt also is it makes it more water resistant. Not gonna be waterproof, but uh, more water resistant anyway. Did they roll that? Uh, Hardy had up uh, on the side because of the musket. I didn't really, I was wondering why they did that. If you had the musket, you hit the brim of the hand. Um, I believe that is one reason. The infantry would have had it up on the right side, I believe anyway, be right where the other branches would have been up on the left. I'm sure if you look at original pictures and whatnot, I'm sure you can find examples where it's the opposite. Um, but again, this is the way that they were issued, so you might not even have any of the brass. You see 
a fair number of original pictures where this is basically how they're wearing them. Sometimes they styled them, they might have kind of crimped them up uh, so be more what we would consider more like a cowboy hat look today. Uh, they might have did something different with the brand, but this would be how they were issued anyway. Um, they didn't have a full lining, like this one has a full lining on the inside you can see. This one doesn't have a full lining, it has a sweatband and the top it has oil cloth in the front. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but there is on the inside. It says what size it is, there's an eagle. If anybody would like to see it a little bit closer you can see, so you can see it better, just take a look at it at the end. And, but this was exactly like the original that was copied anyway. Now, after clothing, they would have carried a lot of stuff with them. Um, particularly, particularly, the one thing you'd think about is their accoutrements. These are two particular types of cartridge boxes here. Um, well, there were differences in cartridge box, uh, depends on what time of the war, some had more rivets, some were more sewn, but they're all basically the same. This was made for an 18, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, 58 caliber musket, so something like your Springfields or Enfields would have used these. Uh, they would have made some bigger ones for 69, uh, they would have made different sizes for different particular guns, but this would have been a very common one right here. You open it up and that's where your ammunition would go. They did have tins. Most of them would have had two tins. Uh, a little bit later in the war, they did have them where there was just one big tin in, but those wouldn't have been as common and just later in the war as far as I'm aware. And then you also did have a flap in the front, and you can keep different tools if you want to keep some patches in there, maybe an old shirt you tore up, keep a couple patches in there so you can clean your musket, any musket tools you could put in here and then you could carry them in the field and they wouldn't get lost or as easily lost anyway. Do you roll your own rounds? I do. Um, most reenactors are going to. I'm sure some just, I have bought them from people just that were making them when I didn't feel like making them because I always kind of put it off because I hate making them. <laughs> I tie them. Um, some people tie them, some people don't. Some look terrible, some are amazing looking. I know I've already had some that were made for a particular event where they banned them for us. We had to pay X amount of money and they were the ones that would have been imported from England and they actually dipped them in wax and everything to make them look exactly like the originals. The tins, uh, 40 rounds? Yeah, 40 rounds should fit in here. Yeah. Um, Each tin to which you're... 20. Um, here, I'll pull one out actually. Okay. Half pulled it out. You have a top on here. And then you have a bottom here where you can set an arsenal pack right inside here. If you want to take them out ahead of time, I suppose a lot of times they would have done that also, but you could fit a full arsenal pack in the bottom. Yep, yeah, each time you got them, I believe from every arsenal, like he said, you get 10 rounds, and then there'd be another one that basically looked like another round. Uh, there, a lot of times they were different colors, so the soldiers would know, not always though, and they would have 12 caps. That way you'd have two extra caps for every one. That way you have extras in case possibly you drop one, you have a misfire, that way you'd still be able to shoot your musket. Most of the time you'd also see brass, like on the bottom of this, as the US. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. You had mentioned there was 12 caps with 10 cartridges, and the Confederacy issued 13 caps with 10 cartridges. If there's one, it's reliable. <laughs> um, I'm not sure about that. It's definitely possible. I've never heard it myself, but again, you learn something new every day. So it probably depends on what arsenal they're coming from, who made them, all that type of stuff too, I'm sure. Um, but it does have the brass on it, which you see, the brass plate, which is also right here. And this one, although it's not original, was actually, they used original dies to make this, so it's about as close as you could possibly get to an original. And they would have had a lead tin back on it, which you can't really see real good there, um, as well as on the back of the US here. Sometimes these would be worn on the belt as well and not have a sling. Um, it just depends where you were, how, how much you liked the sling. Uh, you can imagine with 40 rounds in here, there's quite a bit of lead, so they get pretty heavy. So for me anyway, I'd probably be wearing this, but you do see lots of original pictures, original columns where they say that they were just wearing them on their belt, so they were done both ways. This particular one, like in a lot of examples, not every example, has it so you can put a sling through here as well as a belt loop on the back there too. Now 
this would be a Confederate example. Um, this particular example um, was taken from a soldier at Gettysburg. Um, it's basically exactly the same, just a copy of the United States. You can see they lack the brass. A lot of times there's no brass on it, no brass plate, no brass at the bottom there. Another thing too, uh, they didn't have as much brass. So on the bottom here, you can see they put lead rather than the brass, like on the bottom of this one. The inside, this particular one, also has, I didn't realize that was in there. Uh, this is oil cloth on the inside. Oil cloth is a lot cheaper than leather, although some of them would have been leather. It just depends on the example. But again, it has a pair of tins, basically exactly the same thing as the other one. Now to go with your cartridge box, you also have belts. This would be more of an early war example of a federal belt. You can see it has a leather end on it here. Uh, the buckles would have been slightly different, but they would have looked the same from the front. Um, it would have went over, just buckled in. Uh, you could put it through the loop. Uh, otherwise, a lot of times you see originals where they just kind of cut it off. The later war ones would have had a brass on it, and then you put it through the brass. You also would have had a cap pouch, which is to hold your carpet percussion caps, which I might have some in here. Uh, they're real small, but here's a percussion cap. Um, it's not an original. Originals will look slightly different, but they're basically exactly the same thing. And this would be um, put, on, put on the cone, and then the hammer will come down, hit this, and ignite the powder inside the musket. So if you didn't have this, you're not going to shoot anything, at least a musket anyway. They did have some repeaters that had brass casing. Cartridge box strap to keep it from flapping around. Yep. <laughs> this will go over the cartridge box flap. A lot of times, if you look at reenactors, they'll wear things all different ways, but you look at pictures of the originals, it's always underneath, like he said, to keep it flapping or, from flapping around. This would be an example of a British belt. Uh, this is the only British thing that I have up here, but British brought a lot into the Confederacy, but they were used as, from the Union as well has a snake front on it, which um, they, the British used this particular style of belt for quite a while. And when they're importing, they sent exactly the same thing. So this would be a British belt, again, used by both sides. This is just a real simple belt. It's what we would call today a Georgia frame belt. However, they weren't just made in Georgia, they are made throughout the Confederacy. The reason why we call it Georgia frame belt is because the only manufacturer that made them was McElroy and Hunt of Macon, Georgia, and they put their stamp on it, so that's where we get the name from. But they're made all throughout the Confederacy, worn at all different times from beginning of war to the end of the war. It's just a real common style. Another real common style would just been a roller buckle, similar to what we have today. I'm sure a majority of you probably have belts very similar to it. And again, they would have put um, the cap pouch on it, possibly a cartridge box, a bayonet scabbard, whatever they, they needed and had at the time. This would be a, a Confederate cap pouch right here. Basically exactly the same as the Federal. There were slight differences. This particular one has only one belt loop in the back. The Federal one that I have here has two. But again, it would just depend where it's made, what time period it's from. A lot of Confederate ones also had two on the back. You also have bayonet scabbards. This will hold your bayonet. This would be what goes on the end of your musket. I'm sure most, at least most of you are familiar with these. I didn't bring a musket today. Um, I figured I'd talk more about uniforms and equipment, plus I wasn't quite sure how they feel about bringing it into a bar, so I figured I'd keep that at home. This would have been a style that was used, um, particularly early in the war. We think it was early war, but a majority of the war, they still would have been used. Uh, this particular one has two rivets on it, where a later version would have had seven. Instead of the stitching coming down here, they would have had some going on there along the bottom. There were some very late examples in the war where they would have one extra one right here, but those would have been, uh, wouldn't have been used very much in the war, just very late in. This particular one is a Confederate example. Um, you can see, again, it has, rather than the brass at the end, they tried to save. So this particular one has lead at the bottom. Some were just sewing. Uh, they didn't have anything at the bottom. Some were made out of wood. Um, but this would have been a style 
very similar, you'll see very similar one throughout the Confederacy, throughout every time period of the war. Now to go along with your accoutrements, some other stuff that you're gonna have to carry. This would be a haversack. This was a little bit later style. Uh, the original ones would have had some stitching going down right here. Uh, however, this would have been started to be manufactured in I believe early, mid-1862. So a majority of the war, a majority of the battles, they would have been issued one very similar to this. And this is oil cloth, uh, so it would have been more water resistant, so it's not gonna get everything wet inside of it, or as wet anyway. And um, this is actually real oil cloth. A lot of times, when you go to reenactment, a lot of times it's not, because this can actually cause cancer. Um, not, it's safe now, but when it's being made, there's a process. I'm not sure exactly what it is. A lot of times they didn't know about making stuff like we do now. Um, kind of like the hats. If you heard, heard, ever heard the term Mad Hatter, it's because they use mercury to make hats. So a lot of times they make them for years, they would literally go mad, and that's where we get that term from. Now inside your haversack, this is what you keep your food in. You get your rations, you keep it in here. You might have extra things like a plate, Maybe a cup. I have an original bottle in here. It's a hand-blown bottle. You might have something in there that you may purchase, maybe some vinegar, maybe some molasses, whatever you can find at the time. You carry stuff like a spoon. This would just be a civilian-style spoon. This would be a federal contract. You see it's actually, I don't know how well you can see it where you are, but it's actually two pieces are soldered together and this would have been a contract spoon, as well as maybe something like a fork. Whatever basically you want to eat with, uh, what you're going to eat, um, that would all be um, kept in here. There's very few examples of originals because most of the time, like I said, your food is in here. So it stinks, it's, things are going to go rancid, it could get moldy, and most of the time they're keeping stuff in here for days, not just a little while. I know one event that I had uh, that I went to we were eating stuff and it was during the summer in July and the stuff we were actually getting, somebody found some maggots in some of the meat that we had. And that was just from the weekend, not being shipped from wherever it was coming from. This particular one, uh, the Confederacy did use a lot of oil cloth. This particular one is uh, copied after one that was carried by Moses Alexander. And it's basically just a pretty much just a bag. Uh, it did have a lead button on it. Um, some would have had different types of buttons. It might have had similar ones to this, but most of the time they didn't, or a good amount of the time anyway. And this one has an extra bag inside of it, so you could possibly change the bag out if you get your hands on one. This one is just a one piece. It's not real big. It's good for what it is. It'll keep your stuff, keep everything in there basically. It's not really gonna keep it good. It's not gonna keep anything else. Um, one other thing is a pulk sack. These came in different sizes, um, but you put your food in here, whatever you want to put in there, whether it be some type of vegetable, maybe rice or flour or whatever you, particular, whatever you had. You just pull the drawstring and keep everything in there. Um, also to go around you, this would be the last thing that you put on, would be your canteen, because you want to be able to take it off easily refill if you can, if you're by a creek or a river or wherever, a well, wherever you happen to find water, which again, you want to keep this on the outside as well because you want to get to your food. You don't put it underneath your belt like you'd see a lot of reenactors doing. You'd want it accessible the majority of the time. This particular one right here is a federal one. A lot of times it had grays and browns. There were some blues, uh, but it wasn't as common because they were using them for uniforms. So you see all different types of material. This is jean cloth, like I said, Union did use jean cloth as well. This particular one is a Cincinnati uh, canteen. Um, there are some differences. A majority would have came out of Cincinnati, New York, and Philadelphia. Uh, differences would be the spout. These were always tin. And this particular one, um, nobody as far as I know makes a correct roll top, uh, but it would have had a roll top on it. Uh, the ones from New York and Philadelphia would have had pewter. And then, um, be a little differences. The ones from New York and Philadelphia, the original ones would have had a leather strap on it. Later they turned to just a cloth strap like this one. Um, in Cincinnati, they never had leather ones. It was always just cloth. Um, one difference too in the New York, rather than having some type of 
jutwine, hemp, whatever they're particularly using, they used a chain. Uh, but that was only done at the New York Arsenal. This is the tin drum canteen. This has been very common, like a Confederacy. Another common would be wooden canteens. I don't have one to show you as an example. Um, the most common way that these would be made, they would maybe just use regular tin, but electroplating was real common at the time. Uh, this particular one is hot dipped. Uh, we still use it. Um, if you go buy stuff from the hardware store, a lot of stuff will say galvanized. It's exactly the same process as today. So if you go to a baseball field and you see how it's not rusting and everything, it's the same exact process as this. Um, this one is also hot dipped, so they were made, all, made basically the same way. Uh, this particular one has a Hughes Pendergrass and Snow Sling, which was copied from an original. Some are just a regular webbing. Um, sometimes you see originals that have maybe a suspender, um, or I'm sorry, brace, uh, <laughs> um, hooks and everything on it. Uh, it just depends where they're made. A lot of times maybe they had leather, so um, I know like the Gardner canteens, the wooden ones, uh, most of those you'll see examples where they have leather on it. I'm sure some are cloth as well. So. This particular one is used pentagrass and snow low. <laughs> Did you have a question? Galvanized. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, if, I don't know how much you know about hardware, but you go to a hardware store, a lot of times you see washers and nuts and screws that are galvanized. It was the same process that they would have used back then. Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, each one's a little bit different. I couldn't tell you exactly how many cups fit in each one of these. I'm not really sure. Um, as you can tell, I believe the tin drum looks, you know, it's a little bit smaller than this one. So it just depends on the canteen. And even um, one canteen to the next, the Federals were fairly close. Uh, these a lot of the same dyes where the fair ones, you might see a bigger one, you might see a smaller one. This is probably about average though right here. <coughs> Well, one other thing that you would carry on yourself is a knapsack. They didn't always have knapsacks. Sometimes you would take your blanket, roll it up, put all your extra items in it, whether it be an extra shirt, extra socks, whatever they have from home, and carry it that way. Want to wear it. And the inside, it has a bag, just like the other one on one side. And the other side, you can open this up and secure a blanket inside of it. However, I don't really like doing it. It doesn't fit real well inside there, so most of the time you can just use it as a flap, put your blankets on the inside and secure everything that way, and it'll keep everything at least fairly dry. As for one of the things you put in there, as I mentioned, is a blanket. This is a federal blanket right here. Federal blankets should be roughly five pounds. And as you can see, they're fairly big. It has, they use different stitching. This particular one is a chain stitch on here, which you can see they put the US here. Um, and then, like a Federate example that's real similar, this particular one was taken from a soldier at Gettysburg that this one was copied after. And I'm not gonna pull the whole thing apart, but as you can see, it has a stripe on the end. And um, again, similar weight. This one's maybe a little bit thinner, but similar weight. And just a real good example of um, how they were made. These two particular ones um, were actually made on original looms. There's only, I think, three in the world that still make it. It was made in, I believe, 1870. So it has a correct salvage on the ends, which a lot of reproductions, even ones that go for a lot of money, don't have. And this is more an example of a civilian type. This was taken off a soldier at Pea Ridge, which, if you can imagine, Pea Ridge was fairly cold. This is a real thin blanket. A lot of times the looms weren't big enough um, to make a full blanket like these originals. So a lot of times what they do is they take two pieces and sew it down the center, like this example right here. To go along with just your regular wool blanket, you also have blankets to keep you dry. This is a gum blanket. It's a rubberized blanket, kind of like I was talking about before where rubber was invented in the 1850s. And this particular Bay US one is rubber on one side and then just a cloth on the inside and had grommets going all the way around. This is a big issue to infantry. Um, a lot of times you could use, you could take part of your knapsack here, uh, the hooks on it, and then make kind of like a raincoat type thing and pull it around you. 
uh, the ones that were issued to cavalry and artillery would have had a slit in it to make it into a poncho so you could put it over the top of yourself. Where did rubber come from back then? Um, I'm not sure exactly what the process was. I believe it did come from the rubber tree, but I'm sure there were some other ingredients that were put in. Um, not exactly sure, not an expert on rubber, but <laughs> the Confederacy a lot of times would have just used oil cloth. Like I was talking about before, um, like the haversack here is male oil cloth. Your havers um, I'm sorry, knapsacks are male oil cloth. This is just basically a big piece of oil cloth. It wasn't as good as a rubber, however, I, it is fairly water resistant. Uh, to a point, and the Union Army also used it at different times. They weren't always issued the rubber. They would have been issued something very similar to this. Sometimes you see grommets in it, whether it would be um, like the metal ones like this or just sewn in, but this particular one doesn't have that. They wouldn't always be black. This one is also oil cloth. Sometimes they'd be painted different colors. This particular one is red, but basically exactly the same as the black one. Another thing that they would have are tents. The United States used what they call dog tents. Uh, basically two soldiers would get together when they were on the march anyway, and they'd each have a half. There were four, I believe four different types that were made. Um, some, had more, some had two panels, some had three panels, some were vertical, some were diagonal, uh, just depending on what time of the war it came from. This is more of an early example right here. So this particular one has three panels, which you can see the two seams in the center there. And you'd take two, two of them, put them together in, in the middle. You could use sticks if you had them, although a lot of times that would be used, or branches I should say. That would have been used a lot of times as firewood. So you could take two muskets, put the bayonet on the ground, attach a rope between the two of them, they, or possibly even just use it yourself. If there are maybe two trees, you could just make a lean-to. Uh, the Confederacy a lot of times used the larger flies, and then they would fit as many soldiers as they could underneath. Um, most of the time, they weren't issued, um, like the United States Army. One thing they'll see a lot of reenactments, so they'll have kind of a triangle at the end to enclose it. Those weren't very common. There were some contracts for them, state contracts, but as far as I know, it was never a United States contract for it. But they would have been issued at different times, and it's just extra gear, so I'm assuming a lot of times those would have just been thrown away as fast as they possibly can. Um, I have a dumb question. Oh, no dumb uh, questions. All this heavy stuff that the soldiers carried, you often hear on a long march that a lot of that is discarded. You hear about this discarding, but there is not much written and written about what happened to that stuff that's discarded if people come up to the house. Um, they could send stuff home if they wanted. A lot of times they would just throw it off to the side. Something's heavy, maybe a springtime, you don't want to carry something along that's you know heavy, bulk, bulky. I know I did re read one report where they were picking up, I was in 10th Tennessee, and they were picking up, I believe it was blankets, it might have been overcoats, I think it was blankets off the side of the road, and it was hot outside, nobody wanted, they were all discarding. But then when it started to get cold outside, they were the ones that had all the warmth and the blankets and everything else, and everybody else was freezing. So it just depended on what you wanted to do. Maybe your particular regiment, if they had some extra room in wagons, they might have done it. Sometimes things were being thrown away before battles because they didn't want things sent home. Uh, your possessions, a lot of times, would get sent home, and if you didn't want your mom knowing that you were drinking or whatever you had, it might be discarded too on the side of the road and just thrown out, maybe a deck of cards or whatever you didn't want somebody to know about back home, also. You don't read too much about what, okay, what's happening with all that stuff that's laying on the side of the road. Some stuff would be picked up, like I mentioned, the blankets were picked up in that particular instance. Sometimes it would just be left there. Um, just depends on the time. Just depends on the time, depending on who wanted it. When it's being thrown on the side of the road, more likely there won't be somebody there to pick up after you. It's just been left there unless somebody in particular wanted it. A lot of times, too, um, they would take knapsacks, maybe blanket rolls, and throw them in wagons, too. A lot of times you hear of doing that during battles. However, some people still just carry them because they don't want to lose anything. Sometimes you might never see that stuff again. So you have maybe a diary in there. You have letters from home. Um, things that you didn't want to get rid of, or maybe you have an extra shirt, an extra pair of socks, and you want to see that stuff again, you might just keep it with you. Uh, soldiers would have carried everything. Uh, a lot of times there was a lot of gambling. Um, 
wasn't, it's kind of frowned upon by officers, but it was still done all the time. So you'd get cards, you get dice, Chuck Luck was real popular at the time, different card games. Uh, I don't have any particular cards here right now. Uh, another thing that would have been leisurely that we would have carried a lot of times, uh, one of the things would have been alcohol. Uh, they drank a lot. You gotta imagine, these were young guys. A lot of them were 17, 18, up 20s, even into early 30s, so they're roughly younger guys. So you're gonna have drinking, you're gonna have boys being boys type of thing. Um, this particular bottle right here, I was take, it was copied after one that was a ship that sunk in the 1850s. So this would be a real similar to what they would have had. There are a couple different sizes. This is one of the smaller ones. Easily be concealed in a pocket uh, or put in a haversack or wherever you want to throw it. You also would have had bigger bottles. This one right here is an original. It's a three-piece mold. If you look real close, you can see the whittling in it. And this would have been just a common style. Maybe there's wine bottles beer bottles, whatever they would have had in, at the time where they could get it. Sometimes settlers would sell it, sometimes they get it from local people, sometimes they buy it, I suppose they probably steal it when they could, it just depends. One thing too that you would carry, every, pretty much every soldier is going to carry a knife. Knives come in handy for cooking, they come in handy as a tool, um, basically anything you can imagine they're going to be using it for. Not so much fighting, but other than that, you can use it as a tool for many different instances. One thing that you carry with you a lot of times too, sometimes they get thrown away because it's an extra thing or lost, is a tompion. This would have been put in your musket, down the barrel, to keep the rain out of the barrel, the dirt out of the barrel, and this one, again, is an original right here. This would be for an 1858, they made a little bit bigger ones for the 69s. There's different styles for different particular muskets or rifles, but this would have just been the real common one for an eight, uh, a 58 caliber musket. Another big thing was tobacco. Um, the most common form of tobacco was chewing tobacco. It would have been the cheapest, um, so that was, came in real handy for most of the guys. Most of them weren't sitting around smoking cigars. Maybe the officers might, but for enlisted, they wouldn't be smoking at least as much. Uh, cigarettes were considered a feminine thing. Uh, guys, for the most part, did not smoke cigarettes. Uh, most of the time, they would have been hand rolled. There were a few manufacturers that started manufacturing them during the war and you could buy them for purchase, but they wouldn't have been as common either. Not saying they never would have smoked cigarettes. There, were, there was a picture in Harper's Weekly of a Confederate soldier smoking a cigarette. Uh, I believe it was a Confederate soldier anyway. And you hear of reports of Jackson soldiers in the Valley Campaign in 1862 smoking cigarettes, but it wouldn't have been common. That would have become more common during World War I when they were issued to guys and they would have came home and kept up the habit of smoking cigarettes. Um, snuff was real popular. Not like the snuff that you see down at the gas station where it's chewing tobacco. It was a real finely ground, uh, almost a powder, and you would actually snort it. That would have been very common at the time. You see a lot of original snuff boxes yet today from that time period before and afterwards. Uh, another real common was pipe tobacco. This is just an example of how they would have kept it. Uh, but you could keep chewing tobacco or other things in here too to keep it moist. And the inside it has, again, rubber inside of it, so it'll keep it as fresh as possible. And a few examples of pipes here. This would have been something that would have been just made in the field. Uh, you can see it's just basically a, a branch that somebody would have whittled out. It has a reed stem. They had clay pipes. Some were entirely clay, the stem and everything. This particular one right here is just clay on part of it. It has a reed stem. This one is originals, 18, 1860. The clay is original. The guy that I bought it from had some original reeds, but he couldn't even tell them apart from the original ones to the ones that he cut in, in the box. So I don't know if the reed is original or not, but it possibly is. This would be a little bit nicer pipe, which you'd see a lot too. This particular one is probably from the 1850s, but this would have been a common style of what they would have used. Uh, you could take it apart in different spots uh, so you can clean it better. These would be a lot easier to clean than something like this right here if you weren't able to take it apart. Now to go with the pipes, or if you happen to have cigars, or like I mentioned, cigarettes, if you were next to a fire and had a branch lighted off of, you would have had a match safe. Um, like some of the other pipe stuff here and a couple of things I just showed you, this actually is an original. Uh, there were more common styles. This is one of the fairly common ones here. 
Uh, you can tell it's a little bit worn. It would have been more of a brass color. You can see some of that's been worn off the plating on it. And it just has a button on the side that flips open. And you can take your matches out and a striker on the bottom. So, yes? What do you know about breast plates? I know there was such a thing because Johnny Jewel in the 21st Wisconsin wore one, but it got so heavy in the marching that he oh. took it off and threw it away. And they wouldn't let him throw it away, so they kept bringing it back to him. But that's a story about Johnny Jewel. But what do you know? Um, I mentioned I did have this breast plate here. I do have one more back there. It's the same. Oh, a whole breastplate. I, I thought you meant the breastplate here. Um, there are some original examples of it. Sometimes they were sold by sutlers. However, they would have been heavy. I don't think they were used very often. Um, I know from what I have heard, the soldiers that were wearing them, it didn't really stop the ball, it just slowed it down. And if anything, probably made the wound worse than if they weren't wearing anything to begin with. Uh, it just would have been one of those things that wasn't very common. Uh, you're not gonna hear it very much in original accounts. Um, I've heard basically the same amount of stories where somebody has a, a Bible in their pocket and the bowl, the bowl stopped from the Bible more than the breastplates that they were selling there. Does anybody else have any questions about anything? I know that you didn't have any vests there. I know the military didn't issue a vest, but they were fairly popular from in the soldiers. Um, they did have vests. Sometimes they were sent from home. Sometimes it'd be a military style. A lot of times officers would have them. They wouldn't have been quite as popular for enlisted. They were down south, so a lot of time it's going to be hot. You really don't need extra clothing. It's and more winter time. More winter time. Extra layer. Um, they did wear them a lot in civilian, so it's going to carry over. Um, I think from what you see at reenactments, I know some of your reenactments, you're going to see a lot more at reenactments than what you've probably seen back in the day. You look at original pictures, a majority of the time you're not going to see them wearing a vest. Uh, possibly something they wore back at camp, but when you see them in pictures, even in the field, you're not going to see them real often. Not so much for officers, like I mentioned, but at least for enlisted men. Yes? I had read once, uh, like say in the colder weather when they wore all that stuff, and if you uh, carried your musket and you carried a, a pistol and a sword and all that stuff, you were carrying anywhere from uh, 50 to 70 pounds of stuff on you continually. It does get pretty heavy. I remember one knapsack, I haven't, I don't have it here, I actually sold it a while back. I had thinner straps on the, the shoulders. After weekend, you could actually see my shoulders were black and blue where those straps were. So. It, it does get heavy with that stuff. The stuff does get heavy, especially if it starts raining all out, it gets wet, it's gonna get heavier even, even more. Um, early on, they'd be carrying everything they possibly could, and a lot of times, like you were talking about before, it would have been thrown by the side of the road. They didn't need something that was heavy, they would throw it out. Um, I lost my thought there, I'm sorry, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was basically, I remember the one, there's one particular picture, I think it was in Harper's Weekly, I could be wrong on that, but it showed something about a soldier, a brand new soldier, and it showed him where he's just packed to the nines. He had a huge backpack looking thing with everything he could possibly fit on himself. And then it showed a veteran soldier or something like that, and he basically doesn't have anything on him, and he's just marching with you know minimal amount. Um, a lot of times you'd hear of Confederate soldiers, um, maybe it's because they weren't issued it, couldn't have it, but they wouldn't have cartridge boxes. They would just keep everything they had in their pockets. Um, especially in the Confederates, Confederacy again, they wouldn't have had bayonets all the time, so a lot of times you just have your belt. Most of the time bayonets weren't used in combat, it was more used as a tool than anything for, as I mentioned, putting up your tent. Uh, it could be used for digging if you're in trenches, you can use it to kind of dig in. Uh, one thing too is a lot of times with, if after battles, they would take some and bend them so that way it could be used as a hook rather than pulling the dead. They would hook them underneath the collarbone and pull them that way to wherever they're being buried or wherever they happen to be pulling to at that time. Yes? You also see the references in pictures of uh, stuff rolled up in a blanket and looped over the shoulder yep. rather than the, the pack. You do see that a lot. Um, original pictures, you see them on both sides uh, going across. Um, you can put a shirt in there, socks, whatever you want to put in there, personal items, and tie it at the bottom. You might put a couple ties on it, depending on however you want to do it. Sometimes they would twist them, that way it kind of kept your stuff in a little better. Sometimes they weren't twisted, it all just depended. Everybody's a little different. You had your regulations for cartridge boxes going on the right side, bayonets going to go on the left. 
Um, but some things that you'll see with um, maybe the haversack or a canteen, they could go both ways. Typically, you'll see pictures, haversacks and canteens are going to be on the left, but you see them both ways. Um, again, you're going to want to put your canteen on the top. You're going to want to put your haversack over the top of at least your belt and, and cartridge box. That way it's easily accept, accessible. You get hungry, you can pull something out. You get issued something, you can pull it out, especially a canteen. If you're on the march, if they're somewhere where they're filling up canteens, you can get to it easily. You can take a drink easily. I don't know how many times I put my um, knapsack on over the canteen, not thinking, and then you can barely get to it type of thing. And it's not a good thing if you're marching real far. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? With the canteens, there was one they called the bullseye where it was... A bullseye lost. was... A bullseye is basically the same as this right here. Um, some of them had different... I don't know exactly how many rings there were. Some of them had more rings, some of them had less rings. It just depended on... I don't know if it was who made them or maybe exactly what year it was, what time of the year, who was particularly making them. But they would have had rings. Um, they say it's for strength. I don't know how much it really strengthened them, um, but they would have had rings on, on the inside in the metal part. Um, most of the time they would have been covered like this. It helped keep it cool, the water cool inside, help protect your canteen at least somewhat, but mainly it was just cool, cool the water on the inside. You see a lot of them today, but uh, a canteen like that where they cut them in half, and use them as a frying pan, is that really good? Yeah, they would have done that if they would have had them. Um, actually, you see Confederate soldiers would be more of a prized possession if they get a hold of a Federal one because they were better. A lot of times they would trade for something or however they came across them. And they use them as a frying pan. They would have used them for a frying pan. One thing I see reenactors do a lot of times is put a canty in half. Okay. They would throw them in the fire, let the lead soldering kind of burn out, and they can use it as a frying pan. They'll put them on the outside. As far as I know, that was never done during a war. You'll never see an original picture of somebody doing that. You'll never hear of accounts doing it. It's something that reenactors started probably in the 1980s. Any other questions? Oh, was there a, a difference in belts from the belts they wore for like the Confederate belts compared to like a regular belt hold your pants up or anything? For the most part, they were similar. Um, I know like the roller buckle here would have been another very common style for that. They would have been thinner. You wouldn't have, I believe this is an inch and a quarter, inch and a half right there. So they would have been a little thinner to hold your pants up. They didn't have belt loops like we have today on your pair of Levi's or whatever. So it would just went right around. Something if they had the buttons on for suspenders, they might put them underneath the buttons, just kind of hold them in place and just tighten it best they can. Yes? You were Mm -hmm. Let's just say it was a Union soldier and they were issued a Model 1855 musket. Would have they had a, the same equipment for carrying their tape primers? I'm not sure exactly what they would have used for tape primers. Uh, they probably had something a little bit different, I'd assume, but I'm not really sure on that one. Most of those tape primers were supposedly waterproof, so I know the ones for sharps were the disc primers. One thing, too, is even if they didn't, they might have that particular style of cap pouch as well because you didn't necessarily have to use a tape primer. You could just use a regular cap on the Model 1855 if you, if you didn't have any, or maybe yours might have been faulty or what, for whatever reason anyway, but I'm not sure exactly what they use for the tape primers. When I reenacted, <clears throat> I was told <clears throat> you put wool in your cap box because it was to keep the sound out. I have a hard time, you know, I think. I've never <laughs> heard that. I mean, most of the time. The, they would rattle with all the rest of the equipment and there's noise and, you know. There were a few kind of surprise attacks, but for the most part, especially early in the war, they're just <coughs> lining up like Napoleonic tactics. Put, uh, in their, <coughs> in their cap box and put the caps in over the. Uh, the I mean, there is, there's yeah, there's wool in it. But I thought that was a key one in there. Yeah, oops, I dropped the cap. But there is wool on the inside, which you can see right there. You also would have had a comb pick right here in case it gets clogged. You can stick this down there and get it unclogged, or at least hopefully get it unclogged. But I've never heard them putting extra wool on a cap pouch. I mean, it's not going to rattle that much. You can kind of hear it. <clears throat> I don't see them really igniting. I mean, anything's possible, I suppose. 
Um, maybe if you got hit, I know my stepdad talks about once in a while when he was a kid, they, him and his friends would all carry matches in their pocket and they'd throw them at the ground and they'd start on fire. And mm -hmm. one time he was playing baseball and the baseball hit him in the leg and they all ignited. So I suppose stuff like that could possibly happen. But I don't think there was a rule. I've never heard it before. I'm kind of guessing not. I mean, in the cartridge box is definitely nothing's really going to fit in there if you have a full cartridge box. Even these, you have a full, it's not going to be rallying around much. And even if you have a ton of soldiers, uh, I've been to events where there are thousands of reenactors and I never heard caps rallying around. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you for coming. And like I said, if anybody wants to come up here, you can.